Hi everyone, uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, we'll be starting the webinar shortly. Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Learn how CBT Nugget securely connects VPC in minutes with Juniper Networks and AWS. Uh, when you join today's webinar, you select it, uh, join either by phone call or your computer audio. Uh, you can change that selection by accessing uh, the audio panel. Uh, also from this control panel, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's uh, presenters by typing your questions into the question pane. We'll collect this and address them during the Q&A sessions at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason we could not get to your questions, we plan on responding to uh, through email. The deck will be available through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation. So keep an eye out for that email. My name is Pratik Mankad and I am a partner solution architect with AWS Marketplace. AWS Marketplace is a, a managed and curated software catalog where sellers can quickly market and sell their products and buyers can easily find, procure, and uh, immediately start using uh, third-party products. So my job is to help uh, sellers, ISVs, understand about AWS Marketplace, uh, guide them in their product design, and help them in uh, modeling and listing their uh, products on AWS Marketplace. So there are a number of uh, reasons why companies like you are quickly migrating to AWS. Uh, the first one being agility. AWS offers uh, customer to uh, deploy resources as as desired. Uh, it, uh, you can deploy hundreds or even thousands of servers uh, within minutes. It allows, uh, this allows uh, uh, companies to quickly uh, develop and launch their application. It allows teams to experiment and innovate uh, uh, quickly and efficiently. And uh, if, if the experiment fails, you can uh, deprovision the server without any risk. The second being the cost. If you look at how uh, people end up moving to cloud, almost always the conversation starter ends up being the cost. AWS allows to allows to offer the um, um, capital expense uh, with the variable expense. Basically, you only pay for the resources uh, that you end up using. The third one is being uh, the elasticity. Uh, you can you don't need to over provision the resources you can just provision the resources that you actually need uh, knowing that you can scale up or down uh, to align with your business needs this definitely allows you to uh, reduce the cost again and allows your customer the flexibility to meet their users demand the security uh, is our top priority if you observe aws cloud 
we deploy same kind of uh, security measures as you would find in traditional data centers like uh, physical security of the data centers segmentation of network isolation of uh, uh, servers isolation of storage uh, we also offer shared responsibility model with our uh, uh, customer. Basically, AWS is responsible for managing and uh, uh, operating uh, host operating system and virtualization layer all the way to the physical security of the data center and customers are responsible for uh, building secure applications. We will cover uh, this in detail along the presentation as well. And and it allows you to launch your applications globally within minutes. You can deploy uh, your applications using AWS globally within minutes. AWS offers a wide variety of uh, networking services and uh, with four of them being at the, uh, at the center of the networking offerings, core networking offerings. Uh, the first one being Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. Uh, it uh, allows you to uh, securely, uh, uh, it allows you to provision logically isolated sections of AWS cloud where you can launch AWS resources in virtual network that you have defined. Uh, then there's AWS Direct Connect, which is uh, an alternate to using the internet to connect customers on premise infrastructure to AWS. Then we have uh, Amazon Elastic Load Balancing, ELB. It automatically distributes incoming application traffic to across multiple uh, targets, uh, including Amazon EC2 instances, container, and IP address. And then we have Amazon Route 53, which is a highly scalable and highly available and scalable uh, domain name system, domain name registration, and health checking web services. Your Amazon VPC offers a strong uh, segmentation. Uh, what it means is like you, uh, it's not connected to any other network. But when you have multiple VPCs, uh, transit VPC can uh, uh, simplify the connectivity. So what is transit VPC? Transit VPC allows you to, uh, allows, uh, to connect multiple uh, Amazon VPCs and remote networks in uh, different AWS regions, uh, different uh, uh, availability zones and across different AWS accounts. It is built on uh, on the hub and spoke model where Transit VPC is the hub and uh, uh, other VPCs and your on-premise infrastructure connects to the hub as a uh, spoke. Transit VPC eliminates the configuration delay in, uh, and it accelerates the data transfer. So this is the basic uh, net, uh, transit VPC topology on top of AWS. As you can see, there's a transit VPC, which is acting as a hub. And then there are like uh, other VPCs uh, and then your corporate data center and then other networks, which are connecting to transit VPC as a spoke. And now with that, uh, they can communicate with each other through the transit VPC. So, Let's go over some capabilities uh, that Transit VPC offers on top of AWS. It allows you to leverage virtual gateway capabilities to maintain network connections to the Transit VPC network appliances, uh, connects remote networks to Transit virtual private network, that is VPN appliances using dynamic, dynamically routed VPN connections, implements uh, more complex routing rules uh, based on your Transit VPC designs, uh, you can support any IP-based connectivity requirements with minimal on-premise network changes required to connect your uh, on-prem with AWS cloud. There are uh, uh, basic use cases that uh, <clears throat> um, you can achieve using the Transit VPC on top of AWS. Uh, the first one being it allows you to use AWS as a seamless extension of your uh, on-premise infrastructure. The second one being the shared connectivity. What it means is like uh, multiple Amazon VPCs can share connection uh, to your on-premise uh, infrastructure, partner networks. The third use case being uh, 
the monitoring and visibility. Transit VPC helps to increase transparency and enables uh, transparency and enable rapid virtualization of data being transferred. And uh, the fourth one is you can build uh, your uh, you can build a private network that spans uh, two or more AWS region. So these are like uh, four. Uh, th there are many use cases as you explore that can fit your business uh, needs, but these are uh, basic uh, common use cases for transit VPC on AWS. So you can build a transit VPC with AWS Marketplace offerings. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I work with AWS Marketplace and AWS Marketplace is a managed and software uh, curated software catalog. So it allows buyers to quickly find, procure and immediately download and start using the solution. It allows them to uh, save money with the pay-as-you-go pricing. Uh, which means they only pay for the resources that they use and it allows them to scale globally across all AWS regions. All right, thanks uh, Pratik. I appreciate the, the setup there. Um, my name is Scott Snedden, everyone. I'm a evangelist and, and uh, architect at, at Juniper, I'm working with our customers on their cloud adoption, you know, whether it be talking about how they're developing their private cloud environments, but more and more, and, and you know, as we work with more customers on their, on their cloud journey, um, more and more customers are taking advantage of, of AWS, and, and AWS is certainly the leader in, in the public cloud space with, with a very powerful and rich ecosystem of tools uh, for you to use. Um, you know, this model of, of transit VPC and, and how we're able to build interesting topologies in, in a secure way um, makes AWS very compelling and, you know, is an exciting place for Juniper to be able to participate. And so, you know, Juniper has a, a lot of tools in our portfolio around connectivity and around, uh, um, you know, routing and switching and firewalling. What we're offering here in the AWS marketplace for Transit VPC is um, our virtual firewall. Uh, first, I want to go back to something that Pratik mentioned earlier in the presentation. And this is the AWS shared responsibility model. Um, so this diagram, this is an Amazon diagram. Juniper didn't develop this one. Uh, this kind of details uh, what what we mean by the the shared responsibility model um, you know in a nutshell amazon is is responsible for the security of the cloud aws builds an environment for you to run workloads on top of that includes compute and storage and database and networking and all kinds of services around that um, networking connectivity global infrastructure and footprint and aws will take responsibility for ensuring that that environment is secure um, and is sound and, and is impenetrable uh, but the customer or you, the user of AWS, is responsible for security, securing in the cloud. So the data you place in the cloud, the workloads that you spin up and, and run on top of the AWS infrastructure, um, the, the uh, programs that you're developing and, and all of your deployment tools, it's up to you to secure those. And, and it's up to you to ensure that those are compliant with whatever security practices that you have in place. Uh, AWS and, and their partners like Juniper have solutions to help you with this. Uh, there are many best practices published. Um, if you attend the AWS events around the world, uh, you'll see lots and lots of discussion and presentations and sessions on how to go about securing your data in AWS, um, but really it's up to you to do that. And so Juniper's here to help you with that. And so what we provide in this environment is our virtual firewall. Uh, we also have an offering around virtual routing, but today we're focusing on, on, on our, our virtual flavor of our next generation firewall. So if you're familiar with Juniper, you, you're probably familiar with the SRX line of, of next generation firewall. These are high performant uh, data center class all the way down to small office and branch office size physical firewall platforms. We also have a virtual flavor of that SRX. It's called the VSRX. Um, this is a feature rich, full featured firewall platform that also is running the Junos operating system, which is the foundation of all of Juniper's products uh, and brings you a full featured set of routing 
Um, so you can build topologies and run routing protocols and you know, create um, segments of routing and isolation and, and provide all the functions that you, you'd expect from a Juniper routing platform, coupled with um, full-featured firewall for stateful inspection. So, you know, using VSRX as your transit VPC hub opens up all kinds of opportunities for securing your data in flight, as well as routing and building interesting topologies and, and connectivity options. So, what we can do is build a seamless layer three extension um, to AWS from your private data center. Uh, built into the VSRX platform is an integrated uh, Fire, or sorry, integrated VPN for advanced security. We're using IPSec VPN tunneling. Um, it opens up a model to let you have a consistent networking and security framework um, across your hybrid environments. So if you're using Juniper security platforms in your private environment and your branches and your data centers, this is the same platform in a virtualized version to run on the public cloud. And because of that, you can continue to use the same management tools. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more later, but as part of the SDSN framework that Juniper um, has brought to market, you can, um, use those tools and security director and those kinds of things to manage the security policy and monitor the, the virtual SRXs. And then we present this to Amazon in our virtual format um, through the AWS marketplace with a simple, scalable, flexible licensing method that, that we'll talk about later on as well. So the key capabilities for, for virtual SRX and Juniper in, in this transit VPC model are, are really just to allow you to build a hub and spoke topology. Um, without transit VPC, what generally tends to happen is as you deploy applications into various VPCs and start to spread those out into various locations and, and availability zones, uh, you'll generally need to build a VPN tunnel or a pair of VPN tunnels back to your headquarters for each of those VPCs in various regions. And that's fine at, at, at a smaller scale, um, but you know if your cloud environment is very dynamic and you're continually deploying new applications, or you're letting your developers provision their own VPCs and deploy, well, the process to establish those VPN tunnels between um, your private data center and the VPN gateway function in Amazon for each of those VPCs can become cumbersome. And so what the transit VPC solution with, with VSRX allows you to do is establish one set of redundant VPN tunnels from your private data center to a location um, within AWS. And then from there, each time you need to add an additional VPC, you would just establish a spoke VPN tunnel from the VSRX running in your transit VPC hub location out to the VPN gateway on the remote location. And then that transit VPC hub can also become a security point where you can use the um, intrusion detection and, and uh, IPS functions and next generation firewall functions contained with the VSRX to become a bit of a security gateway for all of those AWS resources. And then because we're talking about consuming this in AWS, it is highly automated and, and fits in with the DevOps and deployment models that you're used to today within AWS to deploy new workloads and then automate the provisioning of these uh, transit VPC hub and spoke sites um, using cloud formation templates. So that cloud formation template is really intended to simplify the resource provisioning and management. Um, if you're an AWS user today, you're probably familiar with cloud formation. Uh, it's a very powerful set of tools um, that AWS presents to allow you to manage your workloads um, through DevOps practices and, and workflows. What we've done at Juniper and with our customers like CBT Nuggets is we have developed a set of uh, cloud formation scripts specifically for VSRX and for the transit VPC use case to enable an automated deployment um, of these connectivity and security policies um, to go along with the automated deployment of your applications. And you know, really key in this last point here is we're going to allow you to treat this network infrastructure as code. Um, traditionally, the, you know, we've seen this growth of DevOps and 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 DevOps automation practices within the cloud teams and the, and the application development teams within our customers. Oftentimes the network teams and the security teams have been left out of that process and are kind of left behind. And, and so what we're working hard in general at Juniper and specifically with AWS in these use cases is to present tools 
to let the network be a part of that DevOps process and let the security policy be a part of that DevOps process. Um, another use case to kind of expand on the Transit VPC is you can use Transit VPC, virtual SRX and physical SRX to really enable uh, enterprise global expansion. So you can use the Transit VPC topology, you can use SRX as back in your private data center to connect multiple data centers together and have this VPN topology just be the foundation or the backbone of your global expansion. Um, we have a lot of customers that have two or three data centers, maybe scattered around multiple places in a continent or on multiple continents. But then as they expand their business footprint, they'll leverage AWS um, and their global footprint to extend beyond that. And by using the Transit VPC solution with VSRX, you're able to do that very seamlessly and in an automated fashion, um, no matter where you place those workloads. And we can bring this together with a unified policy and management framework um, using Security Director and our SDSN tool set to make sure that you've got a unified platform for management of security policy and configuration, implementing things like uh, intrusion prevention events, threat pre prevention, as well as VPN security connectivity. You can also take advantage of the Juniper tools like Sky ATV, ATP and, and uh, our, our Spotlight uh, products to be able to look into the traffic that's flowing and, and, and ensure it's as secure as possible. So, one of the things and one of the tools that we bring to bear through our SDSN toolkit um, in the Security Director Policy Enforcer engine is the ability to sort of tether a security policy to a workload. And then we can implement that security policy using the virtual SRX in the Transit VPC hub. We can even implement that policy using security groups on AWS. But these orchestration tools around the security director policy enforcer essentially leverage the meta tagging ability that exists within AWS and exists in some of the private cloud platforms to identify users and workloads and then automatically deploy the security policy as needed um, based on your AWS inventory and where those workloads are being deployed, um, getting you into a mode where the security policy implementation is fully automated and closely tied to the DevOps workflow. So, you know, to kind of summarize on those points, um, this SDSN adaptive security for AWS lets you support agile workloads and, and uh, instantiate and manage the VPC specific VSRX experts, um, you know, comply with your regulatory requirements and, um, you know, isolate threats as they come. Uh, so the, the SDSN tool set lets you um, you know, deploy and manage your VSRXs. Uh, we can also, you know, distribute policy and enforce policy based on the meta tagging of the workloads themselves. Um, VSRX gives us a full L3 to L7 stateful firewall with IPS and threat prevention uh, capabilities. Um, and then we can, you know, this threat remediation point when we detect um, bad actors or, or problematic workloads, we can automate um, configurations with VSRX and with AWS security groups to isolate problem VMs if they were to become infected and, and if we detect issues with those things to allow you to take appropriate action on them. So, you know, we really feel that working together with AWS in the marketplace offering um, and working with you, our customers, uh, we're better together. Um, you know, we can deliver unified management for a security policy in your private and public cloud, help you lower your TCO by giving you consistent orchestration and automation platforms. By combining um, the VSRX advanced firewall and security capabilities with the carrier class routing, um, that exists on the VSRX platform, you can have a single uh, instance or uh, always generally a, a redundant pair of instances to provide uh, routing and connectivity and security policy. Um, Juniper, I mentioned, has been working hard on automation frameworks, um, and not just traditional networking type APIs, but DevOps-focused APIs and, and things like cloud formation scripts and, and direct Python interfaces into the VSRX as well. So, you know, opening up a lot of possibilities for you to program these network elements and security elements and, and uh, make them a part of your workflow. And so the VSRX and its advanced security policies coupled with the security tools 
that AWS provides you really combined to give you the most secure public cloud environment um, possible. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kurt to go through what you guys are doing with CPT Nuggets. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, so yeah, I'm Kurt Engel. I'm a network engineer at CBT Nuggets and and some and a DevOps architect as well. I've been with the company for six years, and during those years, we've uh, we've moved to we've our our environment has gotten more complex um, as as we've uh, come up with new the ways to um, to give our material out to our learners and to enhance their learner experience. Um, we started out. Um, at AWS, we've been at AWS for a long time, um, probably seven, eight years or so. And we started out with a monolithic um, infrastructure, basically a couple of web servers um, behind a load balancer with a big database behind us. Um, and that was worked good for, for a while, but now we've expanded quite a bit to offer more um, enhanced learning experience. We've added quizzes, virtual labs, um, more enhanced reporting and things like that and with that we've had to break up that monolith and we've gone to a microservice architecture which has um, complicated our environment a lot um, we've started to break up that environment into more um, more break out qa brought out um, prod we brought out dev and we've actually split that up into um, a more in, into more accounts, not only VPCs, but more accounts. And, and we have also greatly increased the number of, uh, of developers and people within our environment as well. Um, and so that really compl complicated our ability to access environments at AWS. With our monolithic environment, we had a single account, single VPC, and a single VPN tunnel up to that VPC. And when, as we add more environments, uh, we were adding those more VPN, VPN tunnels and we were manually doing that. And manually setting up that environment was hard. The routing to those environments was all manual, was all, uh, was all uh, static routes. And so we needed to find a way to be able to add these environments quickly, to be able to put them into our routing infrastructure so that we weren't um, spending a lot of time um, manually entering things, which leads to mistakes. And so that's the lack of automation definitely increased the human error. Uh, we were constantly going back and fixing some things. Hey, Kurt, the, um, uh, the human error aspect is key for sure. Um, you know, I mean, one of the kind of heavy side effects of, of automating processes is, is to eliminate outages caused by you know, people just typing something wrong. Uh, what did the manual process affect in the way of productivity? Um, did it take a long time uh, to uh, deploy new workloads? Were you guys answering trouble tickets and, you know, taking days and weeks to respond? Yeah, it definitely. It definitely added an extra amount of time when um, when a developer needed a new, a new environment to be able to do some work in or test some work out. Um, to be able to sit there and say, hey, you know, I'll get that to you in three or four days, as opposed to I can get it to you in a couple minutes um, or 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, made a big difference. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, it, it, and when it comes to making the mistakes, that was, that was, that was a big thing as well. Um, at CBT, we've tried, we move, move very quick. Um, we're blessed with an owner that um, that comes up with ideas all the time. He's trying to enhance our our learning environment, trying to enhance our product and how we print it, present that out to our user. And so he's there's there's a lot of demands on the developers and on the DevOps people as well to be able to get those ideas and get them out to the learners. So we have our a, a product that is that is very very easy to use and enhances learning experience for people. And so to be able to move from a static to dynamic routing um, to be able to throw some more security in place to uh, be able to, to divide up our environments quickly and effectively um, was was huge it was very big very big for us it's great and we've also added um, as we've added more people we've added more local locations not only aws but um, but uh remote locations i should say um, remote 
um, development houses. Um, we were housed in Eugene, Oregon, but we have a place up in Bend. We have a, a development studio down in Guadalajara, Mexico, and those are all connected back to CBT through, um, you know, point to point VPNs. And those people also need to be able to get into AWS. So to be able to automatically dynamically add AWS environments, have those routes put into our environment, have those routes spread out to all the VPN people as well, is was huge as well to be able to do that quickly and effectively. So the one thing that we've done, all of our stuff is at AWS. One thing we've tried to do was split up our architecture, not only into VPCs, but also into separate accounts. And we did it up separate accounts to help um, to break off the IAM resources and the users. So there's not a lot of, there's no crossover basically. Um, and so doing VPCs with a, with a transit VPC is, um, is pretty straightforward. You throw the, you, you fire up the transit VPC and, uh, and you got a VPC into it and tagging those VPCs, you can specify whatever tag you want. Um, you're tagging the virtual gateway to do that. Um, uh, transit VPC colon spoke equals true, um, causes the Lambda to pick up the VPC, create the VPN connections and hook it up to the transit VPC. On the corporate side, on the, on the data side, I might, I might, we fire up a virtual gateway in the same VPC that the transit VPC is, but we don't attach it to the VPC. You just put it in there attach it to your local equipment, and we have SRXs local, we have a redundant SRX stack local that connects to redundant internet connections, and that connects up redundantly to a virtual gateway in the transit VPC. That is not attached to the transit VPC. It's a little, a little interesting way to do it, but you put it in there, and once you tag that virtual gateway with whatever tag you want to use, um, it actually forms VPN connections into the transit VPC. And so that how, that's how we connect our, our corporate data center to that. And then we do the same thing with VPCs um, in other accounts or in the same account that the transit VPC is in. If you do it with VPCs in other accounts, there's a little bit more work you have to do, whereas you have to go into um, an S3 bucket that stores the configurations for the SRX routers that, that's in the, um, in the transit PPC, and you have to just allow those accounts to talk to that S3 bucket, and you have to allow those accounts to also talk to the um, KMS key. And um, you know, it's very, it's in the, it's in the, uh, the documentation for implementing the transit PPC. And so, and so, when we started doing the transit PPC, um, I think we were probably we were, we were working with Juniper before the solution was in the marketplace. And, um, and it worked, worked like a charm. And uh, I've worked closely with the Juniper reps um, and the people that actually uh, um, coded the Transit VPC um, CloudFormation stack. And, uh, and Amazon has, Amazon's always changing. And one thing they did was they changed their um, AWS, their VPC IDs to a longer string, which broke the Transit VPC implementation of adding VPCs in. Um, all it took from me was a simple email to the developers of the of the solution, and the next day it was working again, and allowed us to add more VPCs. Um, so it, it, you know the, the working relationship has been great. I've been able to to talk with those guys and 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 work through problems which are very few, and um, and get it get it to work for our environment. The as Scott said the the biggest thing that has helped us is the ability to um, fire these things up um, pretty much at will. Um, we are at CBT are working very hard to move all of our um, environments to infrastructure as code. And we're trying, we're doing using CloudFormation um, in, to a great extent. And we do fire up new accounts on a regular basis. And when we do, we just bake the tagging of the VPC or the v virtual gateway into our into our uh, our infrastructure as code scripts, and uh, there's really not much we have to do. Just run those CloudFormation scripts, and it tags the virtual gateway. The lambdas see that, 
and they automatically spin up and create the VPN tunnels back to the transit VPC. They enter the routes into the transit VPC. The transit VPC throws those routes down to our corporate data center, and we have connectivity within 10 to 15 minutes of spinning up a new account. So it works really great. So yeah, infrastructure in a matter of minutes. And uh, there you so, go. So which license are you guys using? You're, you're on a bring your own license now, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, we, we, we do a BYOL. Um, I worked with my uh, with a Juniper sales rep to, to get that and got the license keys. I added them into the SRX, um, which also brings up a good point. We do have full connectivity to the SRX. You can SSH into that thing and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, the script, the CloudFormation scripts definitely set up the SRX, but um, troubleshooting BGP connectivity right on the SRX. There's, uh, there's, you know, it's Amazon kind of puts that stuff behind a little bit of a black box with their virtual gateway, um, which is understandable, but um, it's really nice to have it, have, have the ability to get into the SRX and see exactly what's going on with the routing and the VPN connectivity. Yeah, for you old school, um, you old school network engineers out there, there is still a CLI under the covers. <laughs> <You're through laughs> yes, and all the and switches are there um, for you to exercise. You know, of course, we want to abstract that as much as possible, um, just to ease the automation process. And you know, if if a, if it's a cloud orchestration, or sorry, a, a cloud architect or or a DevOps person um, who's consuming this, you know, maybe they don't want to have to learn the Juno CLI. So, you know, we'll present all the everything that we can through management portals and APIs and interfaces, but yeah, all the knobs are still there for for um, if you need to troubleshoot something that, that isn't presented through an API. Um, yeah. So, you know, as Kurt mentioned, they're using the bring your own license model. Um, there are, as, as it's explained on this slide here, there are a couple of ways to consume the virtual SRX uh, in Marketplace. So there is a an annual subscription through Marketplace and there is an hourly subscription through Marketplace. If you just wanna try it out, there is a free trial trial available. Um, if this is going to be a short-term deployment to handle some bursting scenario, uh, you, you can pay by the hour and, and that's there for you to, to easily consume and, and uh, you know, let you let you deploy and turn on and turn off as needed. But once this becomes infrastructure, as, as in the case of, of Kurt's environment at CBT Nuggets, it really makes sense to either go with the annual subscription or to reach out through the um, the uh, marketplace page on AWS and contact a Juniper sales rep or one of our partners. And you know we'll provide you with a bring your own license um, that again, if this is gonna be infrastructure and it's gonna be left on all the time, it probably makes sense uh, financially to just obtain a license. And, and so, um, you know, very flexible in, on how we go about licensing these things. And as I mentioned, there is a free trial available that I encourage you to take advantage of to try it out. Um, all the documentation on, on the configuration and best practices and links to the uh, uh, cloud formation templates and how to go about using those is available on the AWS Marketplace for Juniper Transit VPC. Thanks. So with that, I think we'll dive into the Q&A. It looks like there's a whole bunch of questions that have come in on the chat. Pratik, you want to? Yeah, I think yeah, thank, yeah. Thanks, Scott and Kurt. I think we are now going to transition into a live Q and A. And again, as a reminder, you'll be able to submit any written question to the question panel. And in the event that we might not be able to answer it, we'll try to uh, get it answered via email. So, I think Scott and Kurt, I've assigned uh, questions to you. Let me take a look at it again. So. Uh, Scott, uh, you want to take the first one? This, uh, what sort of control plane or route scale that I can expect with this transit yeah, so, solution? So, so from a control plane and routing scale, you know, I mentioned before that the VSRX is based on the same operating system that we use in Juniper's routers and firewalls and switches. Um, traditionally, a very scalable internet class router. So. Um, you know, as far as the number of routes that we can receive and advertise, um, you know, very, very scalable, millions of routes, uh, no problem at all. Um, and functionally, you can grow the, the number of IPsec tunnels uh, 
you know, very, very large. So, so hundreds of IPsec tunnels on, on the virtual instance is totally supported. Um, you know, the actual number of routes and things like that, uh, it, it, it's going to vary um, depending on, on your deployment. I think in most cloud deployments, you know, a few thousand routes or a few hundred thousand routes, maybe depending on the size of enterprise network you're connecting to is of the norm. But this operating system is designed to be able to handle and be a full internet routing table type router. So um, we've usually not run into any issues when, when it comes to control plane and, and routing scale. I think that's a, that's a pretty good segue into the follow-up question, which is, I will take it, is there a route limit when connecting my private data center to the transit VPC, right? So yeah, we have a limitation. Uh, uh, it's like 100 BGP learned routes per VPC, and that's a hard limit. So uh, that's the limitation that you need to uh, keep in mind. Um, of course, you can uh, uh, work around that by using uh, uh, route summarization or advertising default route. But yeah, we have 100 uh, BGP uh, uh, learned routes per VPC. Kurt, do you want to take the next one, the CloudFormation template? Sure. Which one? Is that one? Is the, is, yeah, I think it's the cloud formation template customizable. For example, can I include different? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, the cloud formation template, um, I don't think I would recommend customizing it. Um, you can if you're very good at what you're doing with regards to cloud formation. The, um, the only thing that we customized was the, the, IP, the, the IP address that is allowed to SSH to the VSRX is up in the cloud and the tag that is being used. Um, and you know the, the tags is being used on the virtual gateways to add them into the VPC, into the transit VPC, create the tunnels and stuff. It's simply you transit VPC colon spoke, then you set the value to true. Um, we made ours SRX. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I just like the sound of that. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, that's all we did. That's it. I think Scott, you can take this one. I, uh, it's uh, is HA stateful in this deployment. Yeah, so um, the HA, so in general, and, and I think most of the topology slides that we've shown have, have shown a pair of VSRXs usually running in, in different availability zones in AWS. Um, so the, the HA failover is stateless. And so, you know, if I, if I have to shut down and fail to a second one, those um, sessions from the previous would be dropped and then reestablished on the, on the second, um, on the redundant uh vsrx in, in the ha pair um that tends to be you know the feedback that we've had from customers is is that's the desired effect and and, and generally um what is best in this case but we're open to suggestions um we do have ways to do stateful failover with uh our srx's and 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 we could certainly implement that uh for the transit vpc use case if there's a desire for that so you know please feed your feedback through to juniper through the uh through your sales rep if you're a user um and uh we'll take that into consideration so the next question is, uh, can I modify the route characteristic, characteristics of VSRX using CLI or an API? Kurt, do you want to take that? Actually, I'll let Scott take that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did We did talk about that right at the end there. The uh, um, the CLI is still there and, and, you know, it's the Junos that you know and love if you're a Juniper user. Um, and so, yeah, you can modify and make changes to things. Um, in general, if you're automating through an API or using a tool like CloudFormations, um, you want to kind of keep that as as your golden config and your golden method. But you know, if you need to add something that's outside of the purview of your your automation workflow, um, the CLI is certainly there to let you make changes uh, as needed. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, if you want to dig in and look at the the your, your BGP table and and your routing tables and you know possibly troubleshoot things, um, that CLI is there for you and you can use that. Cool. I think Scott, you can take the other one as well, the 1.25 1.25 gig uh, tunnel uh, IPsec throughput limitation. And have you seen any issues that customers are running into it with that kind of a limitation? No, not not generally. I mean that uh, the uh, so, um, and you know, this is as much a, a question for you, Pratik. So there's many aspects that contribute to the throughput limitations of these tunnels. Um, you know, on the VSRX side of thing, VSRX is running in, as an EC2 instance and, and depending on the size of the EC2 image that you, uh, or the EC, EC2 machine that you choose, um, there are uh, 
you know, there's a range of, of throughput um, uh, for those tunnels and for those connections. Um, but if you choose a fairly large instance, we can we can achieve very high throughput. There are also limitations from um, the AWS VPC that has to Correct. do with how they manage, you know, how you guys manage bandwidth. And and so, uh, in general, though, you know, at least in my view of, of what I've seen, and, and Pratik, you can certainly uh, lend your input here. But in my view, generally, people like to distribute applications and distribute VPCs, um, and and spread those out pretty widely. And so. You know that limitation usually doesn't create an issue um, yeah, because you know their their applications are being built in such a distributed way that you might have many many VPCs in various AZs and regions uh, handling that traffic. Yeah, I think uh, yeah we have the IPsec throughput limitation, but uh, in my experience, uh, it has not uh, bubbled up as a, a big uh, limitation from customer standpoint. So I think. Uh, this the next question i can take it up so i think the question stays uh, you have a direct connect uh, connection to aws and a backup vpn connection over internet uh, to aws uh, and i think you're trying to uh, the question is how to uh, you have a 2 gbps internet connection and you are able to achieve only 20 to 30 megabits per second of uh, performance uh, and how to improve that so i think uh, it's a lot of thing. Performance is related on a lot of things. So we do say that we can achieve up to 1.25 gigabits per second throughput, and we can definitely take a look into things like how to optimize your performance further. But since uh, um, there are like some some factors that uh, key factors that you can look into optimizing on your on your router end, we can sync up with the ISP that is involved through internet. But we can look into it uh, how to increase your performance over internet in this scenario and if you're using the vsrx to terminate that um vpn tunnel over the internet and you're only seeing 25 or 30 meg open a trouble ticket with the, the juniper TAC. um that shouldn't happen we we generally don't see that so you know it's possible there's a configuration error or something there but um if it is a vsrx that's that's um being used to terminate that VPN in this case and not the, the VPN gateway, um, let us know and, and we'll help you troubleshoot that. Cool. Uh, Scott, I think this is another uh, question for you. Uh, how can you, uh, might you consider private public cloud pricing somewhat analogous to buying or leasing an automobile? Yeah, and this might be another question for both of us. I mean, for both my view, yeah, yeah it, it is very similar. Um, you know, it, generally people buy when they're building private clouds, they're they're buying hardware and, and buying software licenses and and you know depreciating that uh, those costs on their books over a long amount of time. And when they're consuming public cloud, they're generally leasing um, those assets just like you would okay. be when you're leasing the automobile and you don't actually own that stuff. And and so then it shows up on your books differently. There are benefits for both. There are um, downsides to both. It, it just really comes down to what's best for your company and your application. We also see things, P, um, and you know, Juniper has some models in particular on our hardware platforms um, where we can be flexible on financing and, and give you a, a pay-as-you-go model for your private cloud assets as well. You know, more and more companies like the idea of of uh, leasing and or you know kind of adopting a lot of the pricing models that AWS has innovated in the public cloud space um, on their private environments and so we're we're happy to work with you on those. And I think to add to the leasing example, I I always like to refer to the the so it's similar to when consumer when when a consumer flips a a switch in their home to turn on light and the power company sends the electricity. It's kind of a similar model, right? So. In the cloud computing space, AWS uh, maintains and manages the uh, physical data center where the where these resources are hosted, and then businesses uh, uh, acquire those resources uh, and pay only for what they use. So pretty much, yeah. I think so. This question definitely is for me. I will take it. Uh, yeah, meaning we we are we we. We definitely listen to our customer. We we constantly get feedback from our customer. Uh, we have a, a long list of things that we would uh, really like to do, and this is one of the things that we are looking into and uh, uh, we are looking into at currently. Hey, Pratik, I'm not sure the audience can see the question, so you might want to read it. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Yeah, so the question is, 
when will transit vpc be supported natively in aws so yeah as i said like we constantly get feedback from our customers uh, and we have a long list of things that we would really like to do and we are constantly evaluating that list uh, based on the feedback that we receive and this is one of the things that uh, we are actively looking at so the next question is again i will take it uh, what's the difference between transit vpc and vpc peering so uh, both transit vpc and vpc peering allows uh, you to connect uh, multiple vpcs together uh, but and they both can work in a hub and spoke model right but the the main difference between the two is uh, transit vpc allows you to do the transitive routing meaning if you have two vpcs connected to transit vpc vpc a and vpc b they can communicate with each other through transit vpc versus in case of vpc peering uh, transit routing is not allowed vpc a cannot talk to vpc b through transit uh, through the uh, peered vpc and even uh, the vpc peering doesn't uh, allow the edge routing scenario where you have uh, on-prem connected to your vpc which is paired to vpc a so in this scenario vpc a cannot talk to on-prem versus transit vpc allows you to do that so I think this question, uh, Scott, do you want to take it? So what are the different clients each? If we are catering our services to different clients and each require an individual VPN tunnels to be built, how will Transit VPC help in simplifying the process as a cost-effective manner? Yeah, so, um, the, I mean, there's a couple of ways to, to think about that. If you're talking about different VPN tunnels <coughs> from various locations into a common place, um, uh, you know, the transit VPC solution using VSRX can give you the ability to isolate things. Um, you know, one of the one of the features that exists in the VSRX is the ability to create VRFs or, or you know, individual routing instances. So if you need to create a routed topology between multiple customer locations and multiple VPCs, um, the VSRX can be an aggregation point and then allow you to isolate and use overlapping IP and things like that. Um, and also apply all of the security policy that you might need at that point. Um, if you're connecting uh, that transit VPC to multiple VPCs, um, I think Kurt might have talked about because they have a challenge themselves of, of they're using multiple AWS accounts. And, and so they were able to work with the Juniper team on, on modifying that. Uh, that cloud formation script to be able to build those VPN tunnels from the transit VPC hub to those remote VPCs using the various accounts. So um, technically it's, it's very feasible and, and, and there are ways to do that and automate that. Um, and then, you know, as, as far as the, the cost approach goes and, and, and how you kind of build that back to your customers. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're running a single transit VPC and trying to share that cost and, and maybe, pass those charges on to those end users. Since it's a single transit VPC, generally run out of one account for the hub site, that might be difficult to do. Um, but you know, I think it does add a lot of flexibility around connectivity and routing and, and security policy. I think uh, the next question is for Kurt. Uh, Kurt, off CVT, you do still have some apps housed in your uh, corporate data center? Yes. If yes, what are those you can say? Actually, we really don't. We don't have any um, any apps that we present to the outside world inside of our own data, corporate data center. So the transit VPC that we use, we, we have a lot of stuff at AWS that serves um, internal facing services like you know uh, monitoring, alerting, graphing, things along those lines. So the transit VPC allows us to get to those. Those are all house, housed up at AWS. So uh, our connectivity to AWS allows us to get to those resources and also allows us to um, get to, you know, our programmers and, and, and so forth, to get to the different resources throughout the, uh, throughout AWS um, that, that we access. So, so yeah, so we don't, we don't have anything um, customer facing that is in our corporate data center. I think Scott, I'll let you answer this and I can add the details if need be. Uh, the question is, does this work the same over Direct Connect and IPsec VPN Corp to AWS connection? So, yeah, and, and the answer is yes, it does. So, um, 
you know, there's really no limitation to using VSRX as an endpoint over a direct connect or over uh, an internet gateway or, or a public facing interface. Um, and I'll, I, you know, there, there are benefits to doing that over direct connect. A, a lot of times you know, the idea of direct connect is you have direct connectivity into the AWS cloud, but sometimes you're going through some colo facility that might be running that link over some shared fabric. Um, you know, probably it's probably a VLAN over some switching fabric that, that your colo provider might be running on your behalf. Um, you might want to wrapper that in an IPsec tunnel um, just to ensure security. And, and so, you know, we do have users that do use uh, VSRX um, to terminate tunnels over Direct Connect. And, and you know, the, the features and the functionality are, are consistent and the same from our point of view. Thanks, Scott. I think, Kurt, the next question is for you. Uh, Kurt, did you do any performance testing on the VSRX in AWS, and uh, how much bandwidth are you able to get out of it? We really didn't do any performance testing. Um, you know, in conjunction with the last question you asked me, you know, we don't have any customer-facing stuff um, inside our, our network that goes up to AWS. So our access is mostly SSH access, or um, yeah, it's mostly SSH access into instances up there. Sometimes we pull down large files and so forth. Um, but you know, we we have a, a 300 megabit connection to the internet, um, and we don't we, we're, we're not we're not saturating that at all. Um, and but you know, to expand on that, one of the one of the selling points for us in going with the Juniper solution was the the one gigabit bandwidth you know for the uh, you know port limit on the not limit but port availability on that vsrx um other solutions were selling um their solution with a uh, much lower bandwidth um capabilities on the on the ports at a, at a higher price yeah so it, it was it was very cost effective and, and it's fast we, we we we're not tapping anything we're not we're not coming close to hitting any ceiling on the vsrx at all Thank you. I think uh, we are. I think we will have a, a time for uh, one more question, and I think that question uh, belongs to you, Kurt. Uh, the question is: How did CBD cope up with uh, AWS changing the ID from eight characters to seventeen characters? I got on the phone and called Juniper. <laughs> yeah. That's how I got this. Um, yeah, yeah, we the, it came across that when we did try to add a, a more a new account that we had just popped up um, that had a VPC in it, and we tried to add it to the um, tried to add it to the transit VPC, and it just it wasn't doing it, um, and so uh, it quickly became looking at the cloud watch logs, it quickly became apparent that um, that the the lambda function was failing on adding failing on the longer VPC ID. So open, I, actually, I didn't even open up a TAC case. I just sent some email directly to my Juniper reps and, um, and, and the developers of the, of the solution. And like I said, they fixed it within, within 24 hours. Uh, sent me a new, new CloudFormation script, ran that, and it worked like a charm. In general, we try to stay ahead of those things and, and try to notify customers that, that changes like that might be coming and, and that you, you might need to make some changes to the scripts. And then, um, you know, we do have a great partnership with AWS and, and uh, we generally get notified of, of changes that might affect a functionality of, of our cloud formation tools and things like that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll usually stay ahead of it. Um, and uh, if it's going to affect running instances, you know, we work with AWS to try to notify and, uh, you know, make sure that we stay ahead of changes that happen. Well, uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, uh, Kurt, on that note, we are going to wrap up today's webinar. As a reminder, you will receive an email within uh, next two to three days with a link to the slides on SlideShare and the recording of today's webinar. Uh, we want to thank you all very much for attending. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please uh, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.